Hello, shiny, happy people. We're going to get started. Um, my name is Deb Henningsen, and I'm coordinating Bike to Work Day this year. Um, and I'm just going to give a really quick introduction for our fabulous speaker, Mr. Dylan Casey. Um, Dylan actually started all of our Bike to Work Day festivities in 2003 when he first joined Google. Um, and that first year, he was really ambitious. We had a whole bunch of different things going on on Bike to Work Day, including um, free bike tune-ups provided by uh, Palo Alto Bicycles, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, and uh, since then, a lot of people have asked me in successive years, how come you guys don't do the free bike tune-ups anymore? Well, basically, the real answer is because Dylan is way cooler than I am. Um, but the other answer is because that first year, we found out that a lot of people were driving their bikes to work and bringing them out of their trunks and bringing them up to the station just to get them tuned up for free. <laughs> yes, boo hiss on them. So this year, we're hoping to see lots of people out there riding their bikes for real. And I hope that each one of you will take the time today to inc personally encourage your cube mates or people that you run into or folks in meetings to come and show up on their bikes, having actually bike to work. Um, and we really wouldn't have started doing all this bike to work day stuff without Dylan's awesome influence. So please welcome Dylan Casey. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks, I'll, I'll add a little more context just in case for those of you who don't know me. Um, and Deb mentioned I, I came to Google in 2003 and I think it was like a couple of days before we were sitting around and it was bike to work day and we thought, oh, well, we should do something for everybody that rides our bikes to work. And, and I think that's kind of how it went. Although I can't take all the credit, but um, you know, so we kind of scrambled around and got some people to put together an event and it's kind of grown bigger and bigger. And, and um, I understand that the, there are a significant number of Googlers that commute to work and that's great. Unfortunately, I don't always ride my bike to work, but um, I try to every once in a while, definitely tomorrow. Um, but before coming to Google, I was a professional cyclist on the U.S. Postal Service team and spent five years racing in Europe. And uh, Deb asked me if I could come and talk today, maybe a little bit about that, share some war stories. I know some of you um, probably saw one of my former teammates, Floyd, come and speak here earlier this year or last year. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of add my own color. And um, interestingly, What's going on right this moment is um, the Giro d'Italia, which is the Italian version of the Tour de France. And there's another one called the Vuelta España, which is obviously the Spanish version. Um, and it's a, it's a race that takes place um, in each country over around 20 to 23 days, depending on the number of rest days or transfers that they have. But I thought it might be interesting to share what a day um, is like, because for those of you who follow it or are fans, you probably see either a snippet from the news or a, a 10 minute highlight on some um, local TV station. So, um, and the reason it's significant is because um, these days are so demanding and so overwhelming that you have to be very methodical. And it's actually quite interesting to know that there's a lot more that goes on during the day than just the race itself. So. Each night, um, and of course, this, this all begins on the night before the race. You actually get there to wherever the start is maybe a week ahead of time because you have to go through all of these um, health medical checks and they do some doping controls and you have to do some media appearances and you kind of take some time to get settled in and get all of your equipment prepared for the race. But the night before, the director will come to the dinner table and he'll hand each rider um, what we would call the start card. And on that start card, it was basically like a carbon copy. On the start card, it would detail out exactly what time you get up, what time breakfast starts, what time your suitcase has to be in the, uh, in the hallway because the soigneurs and the mechanics would come and take your suitcase and put it in the truck, um, and then what time the bus would leave. And then it would indicate what time the stage starts, what time, or how, how long the stage is, where the feed zone is, um, how you get from the finish to the next hotel and whether you're going by car, team bus, or bike. Um, and then it would also indicate what time your massage was, what time dinner was, and what time you'd go to bed. So that was your whole day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there's a bike race stuck in between there. <laughs> so um, I, I remember the first Grand Tour that I did, it was the, the Tour of Spain in, in uh, 
my first year on the team. And um, I, like most Americans, started racing on a small, small teams here in America and then made the big jump to go to race in Europe um, on the Division I team. And I, of course, had this whole suitcase full of all these other clothes and, you know, every other thing that I could possibly fit into it. And then I realized after about two days that I only wore, I wore basically the same thing every day. It started, you know, because you, you have all this like team official required outfit that you have to wear all the time. So of course, I had the heaviest suitcase and thus I got the most flack from the swaniers or the mechanics because they would have to carry them down to the truck. Uh, but each day, so you start, uh, wake up, breakfast, um, Everybody has their own little routine. I was notorious for being first at the breakfast table, um, trying to make my own coffee. I always brought my own coffee. That was kind of my, my little trademark, uh, trademark addition to the team. Um, and then uh, we would get everything packed. You'd run out to the truck, get, make sure all your equipment was in place, um, and then get on the team bus. And it's funny because um, getting uh, nine riders and all of the staff and probably three team cars, um, a handful of mechanics, a handful of soigneurs, which is French for like massage therapists, um, the, the team doctors and everybody all organized to leave a hotel at exactly the right time is, is actually a pure science. Um, and for, for the riders specifically, you know, the, we would all kind of have our various personalities, um, some of us being very early, very punctual, and slightly late. And um, on one of the stages, uh, we, we left quite late, probably 15, 20 minutes after the scheduled departure time. And we actually missed the start of the race and had to spend the first, I don't know, 15, 20 kilometers chasing on as a team. And it was, it was actually quite uh, uh, notorious that evening on the, the news highlights. Um, but from that was born the, what I like to refer to as the $100 a minute rule. And that rule was basically coined by Lance that for every minute that you were late to the bus, past its official departure time, you had to give $100 to the, the kitty, so to speak. So that, that helped us to all be on time a lot more often. <laughs> um, of course... Of course, Lance somehow was not held to that rule, but we figured <laughs> since he was the boss, you know, it was okay. But anyway, so we took all the money from that year. I think we had like a couple thousand dollars, and uh, I, we, we had a nice party at the end of the year. So anyway, bus leaves, you get to the start. It was always kind of like um, ritual to get there exactly one hour before the start. Everybody would, you know, typically you're dressed already. You get to the start, you go immediate, immediately to the stage where you sign on. Um, and if you have to do any press stuff, they, it usually takes place right at the stage. You go back to the bus. You get kind of, you know, your various um, food items, whatever you want, whether it's some sort of like cliff bar, power bar. Um, um, uh, and then the, the Swaniers would also make like the little panini sandwiches or ham, ham and cheese sandwiches, you know, kind of regular food. Because trust me, by the like second, second and especially the third week of a Grand Tour, you're so sick of like race type food. You just want to eat like, you know, uh, sandwiches filled with Nutella and, and things like that that are really easy to get down. So you grab all that, you jump, the race starts. And normally the first, they have what's called a neutral zone, which is nice because you don't, it doesn't really matter where you start on the start line. So um, everybody kind of rolls up, they, they start the race. It's usually some sort of ceremony um, local town dignitaries are there and sponsors, so on and so forth. You start the race, and then they have what's called the 0K banner, which is where the actual race officially starts. And there'll be a big banner um, with a zero on it, and um, the commissaire's car will be kind of driving right in front of the peloton, and he'll have a flag and drop it. And sometimes on, on nice days, everybody just kind of chills out for a while before we really get down to business. And on other days, you can hit the 0K banner at like 60K an hour with riders on the bumper of the car waiting for him to move out of the way. And those generally tend to be longer type days. But uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, you'll come to the feed zone. You know, that's typically a, most races, almost every stage, even if it's a one day, kind of has a rhythm. The first part of the race will kind of be flat out. Everybody, you know, the breakaway will get established or the first kind of hurdle of the day will get passed. And then everybody will kind of take a break. Generally, it involves a bathroom break. And it's very common riders just pull over to the side of the road. 
do whatever they need to do. And if you time it correctly, you're ready to get back on the bike before the last car has passed in the caravan so that you can use the caravan to make your way back up into the field. And this is legal despite the rule book actually states that you're not allowed to draft off of cars, but you know there's certain nuances that the commissaires overlook because it really wouldn't have an outcome on the overall race. So, you know, you want to time it perfectly that you get back in the race, and then the feed zone comes along. And um, each team, it's interesting, I, I learned this after my first year, each team has a very specific and designated spot on where they like to be in the feed zone, whether it's at the start of the feed zone, in the middle, or towards the end. And um, for some reason, our team liked to be at the very beginning, which I thought would be you know, kind of cool. So what, what that means is that your, your team staff is actually standing there in the feed zone, which is this designated zone that you're allowed to, to take food and water and stuff um, in a bag that's called a musette. And your soigneur would stand there with nine bags and hand them out one at a time as you came by. So you had to make sure that you were spaced out evenly with your teammates so that you didn't get there too fast. Um, but then I realized that the problem with uh, being first in the feed zone, because typically feed zones are on a slight uprise or a hill, is that you grab your musette bag in the beginning and then you have to carry it you know, all the way to the top while you're trying to get stuff out of it and there's riders in front of you going all over the place and typically there's always some sort of crash. Um, but I was always frustrated, like, why can't we be at the end? But it was something I was never able to overcome. So, so on yours at the beginning, you grab your bag, um, and typically each musette bag has um, two bottles, one with water and one with some sort of sugary, you know, electrolyte-related drink. Um, if it's a hot day, they'll um, generally include a can of Coke. Um, and um, if it's a cold day, they'll include like a, a Snicker bar or some sort of candy bar, because those are generally easy to eat couple of regular um, power bars or whatever kind of cycling bar, some gels, and maybe like a ham and cheese little panini sandwich or something like that. So you get quite a bit. And it's funny because everybody will take sp specifically what they want. No one ever really takes the whole bag. And then you throw the bag to the side of the road, and there's, there's like, if you're near a town, there's like, like a million kids all waiting to grab them. And it's kind of like bowling, because sometimes you're throwing these things by as you go pretty quickly, and kids are getting knocked over. And <laughs> crawling all over each other trying to grab bags, and it's always quite amusing. So, um, But then you reach the end of the stage, hopefully you win. Uh, you go back to the, the team bus and get cleaned up. If there's podium presentations, you go and do that. And then it's immediately like a mad rush. You go straight to the hotel. When you get to the hotel, there'll be like, um, uh, you'll have a, a, a team roster which, with each rider's name and then next to it a line and it'll s indicate what your room number is. So you look and find out where your room is, you go there, your suitcase is already in your room because the um, soigneurs or mechanics have, have brought it there from that morning. Um, in the hallway, there's the, the snack table which is, which is crucial. Um, and it, it would have like boxes of cereal, cookies, you know, of course, water and drinks, and a cooler full of drinks. Um, and depending on which soigneur was was which was with you on the race, they would make muesli mixed with yogurt, or um, on really hot days, like a, like a, um, like a Jello or something like that, mixed with fresh fruit and stuff like that. So it was always snack time. Straight to the shower, and then you would find out what your massage schedule is. Goes, and by the time. You go and get your massage, you come back, it would typically be dinner time, so then you go to have dinner, and you come back, and you have roughly like an hour for personal time, which means you know email, um, whatever kind of various you know life things that you need to do, like pay bills or uh, you know stuff like that. Believe it or not, it doesn't come to a screeching halt during the tours. Um, you know, a 10 or 15 minute phone call to you know whoever, whether it's a girlfriend or wife or mom or dad, and then. Uh, lights out, and you start all over again. So you do that for 23 days, and um, it's quite an experience. So um, anyway, so I thought I talked about Grand Tours, the tour schedules, um, the musettes. Um, what might be interesting to some of you is our equipment. Um, it's interesting that when you, at that level, it's almost kind of like what our laptops are to us. Like, you just kind of show up. Somebody gives you a laptop and you go back to work. You don't really think about like, you know, what, what the resolution of the screen is or uh, what kind of keyboard it has or uh, how fast the card is or anything like that. And it's kind of the same with your bike. You don't really even think about it. You just you show up, there it is, it fits, and 
um, hopefully all the wheels and everything works and, and you go off to race. And what's interesting is that you, everything starts off when you show up at training camp, which is typically in January. You show up and you get what's called a race bike and a home bike. And um, they're identical and you set them up um, over the course of the first couple of days because you'll tweak things, raise the saddle, push it forward, whatever. And the mechanics will typically have like a chart for you with all of your specific measurements and they'll try to get set up. So then after training camp, your, your home bike comes with you, you take it home, and the race bike stays with the team and the time trial bike as well and that stays with the team. So the only time that you see your race bike is when you arrive at the race, when you get out of the team bus, all of the team bikes will be lined up and each, you know, typically you have to look and figure out which one is yours based on the name tag. And then at the conclusion of the stage, your race bike, the mechanic comes up, grabs your bike and it disappears and you never see it, you see it the next day. And I always thought that that was interesting because before I was always so, you know, fascinated and meticulous about all of my equipment and what, you know, how many links were in my chain and, you know, how, what, what kind of grease was in my, were in my bearings, stuff like that. But eventually, you know, it, when, the, when the racing was that hard and, you know, the transfers and all of that stuff, you just, you, you just don't even think about it anymore. Um, so it was kind of, it was a, it was an interesting experience for me. Of course, now that I'm retired and now I'm back to figuring out how many links are in my chain and <laughs> what kind of grease, I'm just kidding. Um, so that's that's kind of the you know the typical day and and some of the ideas about the tools of the trade, so to speak. Um, I figured I'd leave some time to answer questions. Hopefully, you guys have some. Um, you can ask me anything that you want to ask, or I can elaborate on anything specifically. Sure. I think there's a widespread, widespread perception since about World War II yeah. that uh, drugs and doping are an everyday part of every race. I wonder if you can talk about all of that stuff. Sure. Um, interesting, World War II, why World War II? First, the question is, I, I, to paraphrase for you, you know, is, is doping just an everyday part of cycling? So, um, but I'm curious, why World War II? Uh, just to say, it's been a very, very long time people have had a perception that drugs have been an everyday part of racing yeah. for a very long time. Well, you know, to be honest, I think um, what's interesting about um, cycling, and this this is this may be relevant to why how I arrived at Google. I'm sure that's probably a question. You're a bike racer. How now your work at Google? How's that work? Um, in a cynical kind of perspective, cycling um, is just real estate for advertising, right? <laughs> just like almost everything is. I mean, it's 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 interesting because at the time, you know, I was all I was focused on training and trying to be the best athlete that I could be, and and I had all of these very you know specific personal ambitions: go to the Olympics, win national championships, race on the best team in the world, um, and. Towards the end of my career as an athlete, when I was starting to think about what I wanted to do next, I came. I'm like, this is just all advertising, and it turns out I wasn't the only one that had that epiphany because so did um, the uh, ASO, which is the Amory Sports Organization, that is the owner of the Tour de France, um, the Gazzetta dello Sporto, which is the Italian magazine that owns, or that, or Italian newspaper that started the the, the Tour of Italy. And they too said, hey, this is a great vehicle to sell more newspapers and to sell more ads. And one of the reasons is because it was such a prolific sport, it had so much exposure. Um, and so it was a great uh, venue, a great piece of real estate to sell more advertising, sell more newspapers. Um, and by the way, ASO also owns Le Equipe, which is the French sports magazine. Um, and so over the years, to sell more newspapers, more, they figured out that more drama, you know, the more exciting, the more scandal, the more like controversy, because it wasn't enough just to talk about who won or what the time gap was or uh, what size chain rings they were using, because, you know, that was kind of boring. And for a sport that's unique in the sense that um, anybody can do it for the you know, not necessarily at the professional level, but anybody can ride a bike, anybody can go out on a hill and ride as hard as they can up it. Um, most people can buy the same exact equipment that's used um, at the professional level, which is not necessarily the case for like NASCAR or Formula One. Um, and so it was like, had this common person sport. I mean, cycling in Europe has always been very 
blue collar. You know, it's not often that riders up until recently were making enough money to have, you know, huge fortunes and retire. So the short answer is I personally believe that the reason it's, it's prevalent and it has this perception is because the media has decided to make it a big story and it sells more newspapers. I mean, I guarantee you, um, L'Equipe, which is the French, French newspaper uh, involved with the Tour de France, has sold way more in the last couple of years than they ever did before. So th hopefully that answers your question. Yeah? Uh, every time I watch the Tour de France coverage, they always say, like, riders in the Tour de France consume an average of 8,000 calories a day or sure. 20,000 calories a day. <laughs> and from what you've said so far, it doesn't seem like there's enough time to eat that much food. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are those numbers even remotely accurate? And, and if so, are you eating constantly when you're not on a bike? Or what? Sure, sure. So, so your question is is basically, you know, how many calories do you need on a, on a day, in, in, you know, day during the, a, a tour or one day, and, and is it realistic? So, interesting. Um, you know, I think somewhere somewhere in the mid '90s, um, this German uh, engineer designed this uh, computer called an SRM. And it's actually quite popular now. And it's basically a set of strain gauges inside your cranks. Um, and it measures uh, how many watts you're putting out. Um, and then they, they've determined that based on you know, some variables that they can say, OK, based uh, you know, the number of watts that you are generating per hour average, we can figure out how many kilojoules that is. And roughly, we're going to estimate that the human body is, is about 25% efficient, yada, yada. So about four kilojoules equals um, one calorie. And then, you know, and then based on that, they, they actually put it to one to one. So based on wattage output, they can determine that over, if you're, per, you know, you're doing 700 calories or kilojoules per hour, that's about 700 calories. Seven, yeah, 700 calories. So if the stage is five hours, that's roughly 3,500 calories. Um, so you can, you can start to get a basic understanding of exactly how many calories you burn. And then, um, and then you can take your basal metabolic rate and you know, start to extrapolate some numbers and figure out how many calories do you need just to exist per day, right? And so I used to know that my basal metabolic rate was around 1,700 calories per day based on my weight, you know, my activity, yada. So then I would take 1,700, add whatever my little SRM would tell me, and I'd say, OK, well, that's how many calories I need today. So it's true that there are some stages. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, there's this mo there's this period of time where you're trying to lose as much weight as possible while still consuming enough calories to kind of be somewhat, you know, awake. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's it's not uncommon for a lot of elite athletes to you know have these weird eating disorders, but um, and I I myself had my own, but you would actually calculate exactly how many calories you needed. Um, and then how many you burned, and then try to deficit that number by you know, two or three hundred calories per day, maybe five hundred if you were being aggressive, and you could, you know, over seven days lose at least a pound a week. Um, but during the during the actual race, you do not want to diet, so uh, that's a bad time to try to diet. Um, so. The, the answer is yes, you actually do need roughly five to 8,000 calories a day. And um, what happens is over time as your body becomes fatigued, your systems start to shut down. So you don't process food as efficiently. Um, you don't, um, you, your system doesn't work as quickly. It takes longer to digest food. You don't digest certain foods as well as others. I mean, I can remember some stages where the first hour just being in complete misery because my stomach was still full of the food that I was forcing down earlier that day. Um, in fact, just on, on, a, on a tangent, in, especially in the Spanish races that would start so late in the afternoon because of um, siesta, and they wanted the finishes to be roughly like 5, 6 p.m. when everybody was coming back from siesta or whatever, um, the races wouldn't start till 1 o'clock, which was in the heat of the day in, in September. And then, but if you get up for breakfast, you got to eat again before the race starts. So you, we'd come down and have first breakfast and then second breakfast or lunch. Um, so you basically are spending all day long eating as, as much as you can. In fact, the, the director would come over the radio sometimes and say, OK, guys, you know, don't forget to eat. 
um, because when the race gets hard, you know, the race, it's not just flat out, right? A race can be, you know, 250 kilometers in roughly six to seven hours. So there's a lot of time where you're just kind of hanging out, doing whatever. And so that's when you need to eat because when you get to the crunch time, you know, or what we would call the finale, you got to make sure that you, you're not going to have the opportunity to eat. So you got to make sure that you've been eating throughout the day. Um, and then sometimes, depending on what the weather was like, um, and you know, hydration was a real issue as well, especially during the summer. So you'd have to make sure that you were hydrating all the time and had to pay really meticulous attention to all those little details. Yeah? Did you ever write any of the classics? And if so, how would you think about them differently than, than say, the tour? Sure. So the question is, um, uh, did I ride the classics and, and how do they differ from the, from the Grand Tours or, or even just stage races? You know, there's a lot of different little five to ten day stage races that happen during the year as well. And um, the, the answer is yes, I rode most of the classics. Um, I think the only one I didn't ride was um, San Sebastian, although I'm trying to remember. But um, one day races are, are, are totally different because um, the the, you know, there, there aren't all of these other races going on at the same time. Like, for example, there's, there's no general classification. There's no mountains jersey. There's no points jersey. You know, the only thing that matters is winning the race. Um, and so the approach would be slightly different depending on the course, depending on what the day, the weather, all of that stuff. And you'd kind of have an idea of who the team leaders were the day before. And we would have a meeting in the morning and, and designate exactly who would do what. Um, is there a particular classic I can tell you, like some of the... Like Perry Roubaix. Yes. So Perry Um it's funny. The, the first year I did Perry Roubaix, it was pouring. It was like quintessential pouring rain, you know, freezing cold. And um, the first 100 kilometers of Perry Roubaix are on kind of like standard roads, you know, nothing special. And um, there's the first cobble section comes, and it's really vital that your team leader is near the front during that first cobble section because if they have a crash or they're not near the front or you know you don't want them to have to waste a bunch of energy in the beginning so uh, the first half of the team that you start with eight riders you know, and our designated leader was George Hinkapi on that day and we had guys like Cedric Vesur and uh, Vyacheslav Ekimov and um, a handful of other guys on the team and my job was the basically the first 100 Ks. Like I didn't even think about the other 150. Um, and so, on days like that, where where your job is is very um, uh, finite and specific, you think about exactly that portion, and um, and that's the same for the other guys too. You know, their job is to kind of be relaxed in the beginning, let the other guys on the team take responsibility for whatever's going on, um, and then their job comes up towards the end. Um, and so. That race, it's interesting, the first 100K, and, and on that specific day, the first day that I did it, it was pouring rain. And it was just really important to keep George near the front of the race, um, using the least amount of energy um, required to stay there. And then just also to look after him to make sure, you know, if he got a puncture, that you know, there was a couple guys with him to help him come back to the, to the, to the race. Um, and then if he needed any food, if he wanted to take off clothes and take him back to the car, that's something I would do, or bring him back, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is about um, kind of the roles of the different riders on the team. And um, it was always really clear we would go into every race, whether it was a, a one-day race or a stage race, um, with specific ideas on who was going to do what. Um, you know, it was, it's interesting because at that level, everybody's very specialized. Um, and very good at, at what they do. You know, everybody's a rock star for whatever reason, whether you're a, um, an excellent climber or really good on the flats or flat stages or flat parts of the stage or, you know, a really good time trialist or, you know, just really, really good at the overall, which was, you know, obviously Lance was the best on our team at that. Um, and so, you know, each race has its own characteristics. Um, obviously, the tour, um, is broken down into you know 
three basic areas. One, there's the time trials, which is you know up to the individual leaders. Um, two are the flat stages, and the third are the mountain stages, and they typically come in chunks. And it's interesting because of each stage kind of defines how the race is going to develop. Um, so. The first week was always challenging because there's everything, you know, the, the, the um, general classification hasn't really started yet. And most of the emphasis is on the sprinters or the, or the, the riders going for individual stage victories. Um, and so the priority of the team is one, to keep your leader protected um, and have them use the least amount of energy as possible. And then the other is to kind of maintain and watch your adversaries and to make sure that like, for example, they don't go get away in some breakaway that gets 20 minutes. And so if your role is, is like, um, is that to help, you know, to be what, what we call a domestique, you would either make, sh make sure that breakaways that go away, that you, you either work together to, to chase it down or that you're in the breakaway so that the team gets to, to sit back. Um, or, you know, your job might be specifically to stay with your team leader at all times so that when they're maneuvering around the peloton, they don't have to use any excess energy. So it's pretty well defined who's doing what based on what your characteristics and specialties are. And then as the race goes on, you know, the director will help kind of determine who does what. And you have a game plan that's set in the morning um, before the race. But it, then it, it's also very important to um, be flexible. You know, you have to read the race and constantly adjust. And, and change and react and respond um, or try to be proactive as well. Yeah? Can you say something about the training that happened in the months? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So the training um, leading up to, to big races, and um, you know, I'll, I'll try to answer it from a more general perspective because you race probably roughly between you know, 60 to 100 days a year. And you know the rest is training, but races often serve the purpose of training as well. So, um, as an individual, you, you generally sit down and look at the calendar and identify specific races that you want to be, you know, at your peak for. And you identify other races that are just for training. And then there's you know training blocks in between. But leading up to a Grand Tour, and it's interesting because Grand Tours have this this interesting, for, or at least for the teams. You start with like a long team, guys that are kind of have a shot at making the, the actual start. Um, and you work your way down. And um, generally, the race results and training camps that you'll have leading up to the Grand Tours will determine who makes the team. Um, but uh, with all of that said, you, you generally identify. So for example, if, if you're going for like the Tour of Italy, which just, which just started this last weekend, you know, your preparation is going to start in January, more or less you know, with this target of May. And so you'll look at um, certain races that you want to use for training, and then certain races that you want to try to show yourself so that not only can you show that you're good to the team, but then also to see how, how your training is going. You can test things and push things. Um, and it's, it's become, over the years, very methodical. Um, in the training camps that you have leading up in, in the weeks and months right before the Grand Tours, um, you you basically look at the overall profile of the race. And like, for example, if there's a team time trial, not all Grand Tours have team time trials, but if there's a team time trial, you want to take some time and really practice, because that's a, it's a very um, specific event. And you have to be, you know, it's, it's like an orchestra. You know, you have to, everybody has to work perfectly together. Um, and that, that even goes to what are we going to do the, day, the morning of a team time trial? Like, what's our preparation? What time are we going to get there? How long is our warm up going to be? What time are we all going to go over to the start house? You know, I used to, the night before time trials, lay everything out and make sure that I had everything. And, and I would look at my start time and count backwards. You know, because 11 o'clock is my start, so I want to be there at the race venue at 9:30. Start my warm up at 10. Get off the trainer at you know 10:45, etc. So you think about all those little details, and you use you you start to prepare in the training camps. Um, and so there's a there's a period of time where you really really stress yourself and go way way over. Um, with the idea of trying to rebuild the systems, and then you know you slowly starting to lose weight and arrive at the start. Uh, in the best condition and maybe just close to your ideal weight or maybe just a half a pound over, a pound over. So is it true that um, there's, there's a huge variance between the training or the, or the individual people? Like, 
somebody, some people said like Jan Ulrich, for example, had great talent, but he didn't train enough or something like that. Is that yeah. something that is... It's funny, you know, um, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell a story about Jan um, as it relates to his training um, from my own personal experience. You know, it's interesting, and, and uh, I always push to, just tangentially, I always push that the writers give more information to the press. You know, be more open and talk about what's going on. You know, kind of this almost an MTV real world um, mentality. Because I would much rather uh, have the press talking about, you know, what podium girl I was dating versus, <laughs> you know, what they found in my garbage can and, and, and what that revealed about me. Because I think that's much more interesting and, and I'm all for, for, you know, having drama and scandal, but like make it about something that's, that's you know, more valuable than, than some, you know. Yeah, I mean, it just, it just, it seemed, you know, dumb to me. But anyway, um, so Jan, I, I can remember in the beginning of the season, my first race, uh, it was this race in Spain called Semana Catalana, and it was in the Catalonia region of Spain. And Jan, Jan was also there. It was his first race of the season. I think it's in March, roughly in March. Um, I myself had already been racing since January, and you know, w thought I was in pretty good condition. And Jan would show up, and this is uh, 99 or 2000 or something like that. He would show up, and um, he would be so overweight I couldn't believe it. And and um, he, we 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 would like hit the base of a climb or be going up a, a, a hill and Jan would be coming backwards so fast <laughs> that you would almost have to get out of the way, you know, like <laughs> swerve around him. And it, it's really interesting because day by day, you could see in the race, he would get better and better. And he would actually lose weight, like visually be getting skinnier in the race. And I was, I was always so like, Envious of that because at, for me, as the race went on, I'd get worse and worse, you know, and probably even gain some weight because I would be drowning my sorrows with, uh, you know, tasty cakes or whatever the local pastries were. But Jan, he he had the most amazing genetics, and and he, you know, Lance would say all the time that he was the most gifted, talented, amazing rider in the peloton, and I think. He, I don't to answer your question specifically. I don't think Jan um, didn't train. I think that this perception, the perception that he didn't train, was um, born out of the idea that he was just so genetically talented that the only reason, the only like justifiable reason that he wasn't winning the tour and all the other races is because he didn't train enough. I don't necessarily think that was true. I mean, I would see him actually uh, uh, in a race. I, I, I know this this tour of Holland in '99. Um, I beat him in a time trial by. It, it was a short time trial, and, and I don't know how much I beat him by. But the first time trial on the tour of Spain, which was a much longer one, maybe you know a week into it, and about two weeks after I had beaten him, he beat me by like two or three minutes. You know, and so yeah, that's a. It, it's, it was a longer time trial, but the point point is, is he just got that much better, and he just responded that much better than I did to training, and I think that was, you know, just due to his genetics. So that's a long, long answer to your question. Sure. Uh, can you talk a little bit about like the social aspect during the race. Like, did you uh -huh. have like, did you get vibe from other teams, and like, was there like any breaking away moments of like? <laughs> yeah. So, so the question is, is um, you know, were there ever any breaking away moments in in the races? Um, I can think of a few altercations, and um, you know, just to give you some scope, there of the there there must be over 200 races a year on the calendar and you know there are there are divisions there's like division 1 2 and 3 and and every year they pro they change names you know before it was the the division 1 and now it was now it's called the pro tour or whatever but you know just think of them as like major league and minor league um, and in the major league races you pretty much race against the same 150 or 250 guys. And while that sounds like a lot, it's not when you're you know, racing with them every year, year after year. Um, and you get to know everybody pretty well. And, and um, 
because of that, I think there's a certain amount of respect that you develop, and so you're less likely to throw, you know, throw a punch or whatever. Um, although there are moments where things get he pretty heated up, and I have seen riders on the side of the road, and maybe even a few in, in ditches. Um, and you know that stuff just happens, and uh, um, you know I think typically like the the kind of protocol is that you're supposed to do your talking with your legs and not with your hands. You know the the kind of unwritten rule, and it's probably actually in the UCI rule book as well. But as long as you don't take your hands off the bars, pretty much anything goes. <laughs> For some reason, whenever you take your hand off the bar, that kind of crosses some sort of threshold. But um, you know, may, maybe some of you recall uh, one of the stages in, in a recent tour where uh, Robbie McEwen, who's a, a famous and notorious sprinter, actually took his head and hit the rider next to him. And he was relegated for that, but it was just so blatant that you couldn't not. Um, but you know, th there, a lot of that goes on when, when riders are trying to jockey for position, and it's funny because in the race, and you know, sprinters to other sprinters, they hate each other, but then sprinters to the climbers, you know, they're like best friends all day long, and there's like this mutual respect that goes on. You know, like Lance and Cipollini were like would, would get along great, but but Cipollini and Zabel, you know, it, it was like oil and vinegar. Um, but you know that's just the way it goes. Yeah. Uh, so what's the difference between the average speed you, you get when you go from here, you know, around, you know, on the training grid, right, on your own, and like, you know, the the speed that we see in the race? So what's the difference between riding around? Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's funny. I remember. Um, <laughs> this is all very nostalgic for me, but. Um, I re remember one of my first races that we started out pretty easy, and it was a, a 200 kilometer stage, and we were rolling around at about 35 kilometers an hour. And I remember seeing somewhere that the average speed is typically, because you get a race Bible, I, I should have mentioned that too, you get a race Bible with each race, and it indicates like, you know, the course profile and where the corners are and where the climbs are, um, and then it'll have like projections on, um, like a timetable based on average speed. And I remember seeing the average speed being around 40 kilometers an hour. I'm like, well, that's not too fast, you know, 24 miles an hour for 200 kilometers, and there's only a few mountain stages or mountains in the stage. That doesn't seem that fast. But when you start out the first two hours at an average of 30, you're thinking to yourself, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Something's got to happen in order for us to achieve this 40 kilometer an hour average. And the truth is, the last two hours, or you know, when you hit the finale or the, the hardest part of the race, it's going you know, full blast at 55 kilometers an hour for two hours or something like that. So the, the difference between you know, riding around here and actual race speed is, is significant. But you know, that's a lot of, there's a lot of factors there. You know the 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 peloton itself is is this you know this being, but um, I, it's funny even in the groupettos, which is the group that kind of forms on the climb that's not trying to contest the win, but it's just trying to get to the finish to, to to survive. What they have is called the time cut. You have to finish within a percentage of the the finisher's time in order to qualify to race the next day, um, and the groupetto. Uh, would, even, would calculate exactly what that time was. And you'd have guys that were responsible, kind of self-appointed, to determine what the correct speed was to make the time cut. Um, and I was always amazed that the Gruppetto speed was like sometimes as fast as I would ride on my training rides around some of the climbs up here. But you know, it's, it's, you kind of have this group mentality. Uh, so it's hard to say. But the short answer is a lot faster. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on this topic of the psychology of, of the group and so on, there was that famous uh, uh, interaction between Lance and Ulrich when he looked back on the health res. Was that a, a press thing, or how important was that psychologically in the sort of the way the, the, the race went? Oh, no, no. So that was totally press. Um, and. And you know, to hand it to them, that that's that was a great story. It was a great moment. You know, that's the that that exact example that you're bringing up um, is what makes cycling so so cool, at least in my opinion. So, um, 
so to give everybody some context for, for, for this specific example, um, I can't remember which year, but um, going up to the Alp d'Huez, which is a, a, a climb, it's about 13 miles long, and it's in the Alps, and it finishes at the top of this mountain. And there's roughly, the stage itself on this day was about 120 miles long and had, um, you know, three or four climbs before it. I don't know, maybe the Galibier and the Tourmalet. These are all these famous climbs in, in, in the Alps region of France, which are all very hard by themselves. Um, but what happened on this particular day, and this is very common for mountaintop finishes, is that all of the domestiques of each team leader will, will like go as fast as they can to the base of the climb. And the idea is that you just want to string it out and make it so hard for everybody that the only guys that are left are your team leaders. And in this particular stage, that's exactly what happened. Um, and Lance had said, I want to, I want to hit the base of Alpe d'Huez at full speed, like you know, 55 kilometers an hour. And they did that, the whole team on the front. Um, and you expend every single guy. So the only guy that's left at the end, at the bottom is Lance. And so they um, did that. The last guy to pull was um, uh, Jose Rubiera. His nickname is Chechu. And he pulled so hard at the, at the, at the base. And the first kilometer of Alpe d'Huez is very steep. He pulled so hard that when he pulled off, Lance was so, you know, kind of like, oh my God. And wanted, he was basically wanted to look behind him to see what the carnage was. And, and that's when this look, you know, they termed the look um, happened. And Ulrich happened to be right on Lance's wheel when that happened. And so he looked over his shoulder just to see what had happened. And when he saw that, you know, basically the whole peloton was blown to pieces, he decided, well, I'm going to go for it. This is my chance. And it worked out. He won the stage. And I think he, t he put some time into to Ulrich. Um, but he didn't do it to try to like psych Ulrich out. And it's funny because I, I remember hearing Lance talk about it um, and joking, maybe I should make a big deal about it. But the truth is, you know, they were such good friends. He didn't, Lance didn't want to like, you know, pour salt in, in the wound, so to speak. Yeah. Sure. So the question is, how do you, how do you make the team? Um, and what's interesting is that in other sports, especially kind of um, well-known sports in America like football, baseball, and basketball, there's this kind of like traditional path. You know, you go, you play college, um, and then you get recruited, and yada yada. Um, for cycling, you know, there is no real clear path um, other than just winning races. And um, for Americans, you typically start racing in America. If you start as a junior, which means under 18, then you have opportunities to go race in Europe with the national team. Um, and if you're older, you, there's some opportunities um, also with the national team to go race with this other group. But the teams, the professional teams, are always looking for new talent. Excuse me. And, and so they'll pay attention to who's winning what. In my own particular case, um, I started cycling a little bit later than most of my peers um, and, and had this one year where it was basically, I was barely making any money, you know, t living off prize money. And I decided that, OK, this was the year I was going to accomplish these two objectives and try to get a real job racing my bike. And if I didn't do that, I was going to quit. And so in that particular year, I, I decided that I was going to win the National Time Trial Championships, and I was going to win um, the uh, National Championships for this event on the track. And I did both of those things and, and kind of caught the attention of um, the, the directors and bosses at US Postal Service, and I called them every day. <laughs> and uh, eventually, you know, they called back and offered me a contract, and that was that. Um, specifically, as it relates to the Olympics, there was very, um, there's, there's like qualification procedures that you have to do. Um, and you have to set like a time standard, or you have to win X race, or you have to, you know, have a certain ranking on the international calendar. Um, and I was able to do all of those things and, and um, made the Olympic team. Yeah. Uh, so since you guys work here, my yeah. question is about how you um, see the role or perhaps the relationship to professional cycling and promoting cycling as a mode of everyday transportation. That's a great question. So how does, how does um, competitive cycling influence um, 
all of us to ride our bikes more, and, and specifically ride our bikes to work. Um, I think that um, uh, I'll try to answer that on a couple different levels. First, on a technology level, I mean, that was one of the things that I, I kind of got into cycling um, or that got me into cycling is I was kind of fascinated by the, the equipment and the technology, and, and I thought it was cool to have this part or that part. And um, I think that um, professional cycling, um, because of how competitive it is and the requirements, um, it really fuels innovation of the equipment. And I think that trickles down. And so I think bike companies should really try to leverage that innovation to get people excited and passionate about cycling. Um, and I think that will kind of have this ripple effect to get people to ride their bikes more. And, I, and, and then on another level, I think we need to get, um, you know, Google is, is amazing uh, in, in how that they promote and, and try to reward people that ride their bikes to work. Um, I remember a story about how everybody used to leave their bikes in, the, you know, in their cubes and in the hallways and either security or, or, or facility said, oh, we got to get these out of here. And, and um, Eric, our CEO, said, no, 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 I want people to feel like they can have their bikes in the hallways. And who knows if that was a cultural, um, you know, if that was for cultural reasons or if that was just because he wanted people to feel like they could ride their bikes. But, you know, those are the types of things that encourage people. But I think also at the city and government level, you know, we need more bike paths. We need, um, we need to make it um, easier for people to commute to work. You know, I, I live in Menlo Park and I don't ride my bike to work all the time. And I don't know if that's a, if that's because, you know, I don't want to spare the extra time required to ride my bike versus just driving in or whatever. But, you know, everybody kind of has some hurdles to get past to do it. It's not the easiest thing. Um, but I think the innovation is how professional cycling can encourage it. But I think we also need more help from our local governments. Yeah? Can you talk more about, I mean, we see a lot of the cyclists in the news. Can you talk more about the people behind it, like your race director, your sure. trainers and such? How do you, what are their backgrounds? How do they race? How do you choose them? Yeah, what's, what's interesting, so many of you may not know this, like cycling is, is a business. Um, and that was something that I always actually tried to get like everybody to understand. It's like, you know, we're here to do a job, right? We're here, everybody has a very specific role, whether you're a rider or you're a mechanic or you're a massage therapist or you're the team director or you work in what I call the back office, right? Each team has an organization that runs the whole um, the whole team, and you know, uh, it's just like any sporting organization, or whether it's NASCAR or the 49ers. You know, you have this office of people that do things that that are required for the team to run, just like we do here at, you know, at Google. We have people that handle all of our equipment, and handle all of our benefits, and handle the facilities. And you know, we couldn't do what we do if it weren't for them, and vice versa. Um, so, on our team specifically, one of the things that, and I think Lance did really well and, and was one of the great leadership qualities that he brought to the table is that he, he celebrated each individual um, for what they did and what their contribution was. And um, I think because the expectation to perform was so high and our expectations of our peers were so high, we had this personal commitment to each other. So it's like if you're a mechanic, like, you know, you better be the best damn mechanic there is. And, and um, each person kind of took on that personal ambition and that personal commitment. But to give you a sense of context, um, I think on the, in our organization there were roughly 100 people. And um, that consists of roughly anywhere from 16 to 30 riders. Um, and then you'd have, depending on how many programs you would run, because you know there's 200 days of racing and there's oftentimes three or four different races all going on at the same time. And so you might send a team to each race. So you have three or four programs all running at the same time. So, and each program would have typically a team bus, a handful of team cars, um, a team mechanic truck, which is like a big semi. Um, so you'd have, so think of each one of those as being about you know, 10 to 15 people. Um, and then you'd have a whole service course, which is basically um, a, a facility to handle all of your equipment. You know, each, each rider has roughly five bikes and maybe two backups. Um, and then, you know, a million different wheels and, you know, all of the equipment derailers. I mean, it, it's like going into the candy store when you walk into the service course. In fact, the riders oftentimes were not allowed to go there. <laughs> Um, but then, and then we would have a main, you know, infrastructure, uh, main administration office that would handle all of the payroll, all of the health benefits, 
um, manage all of the um, licensing requirements or manage the process of actually entering each race and sending in all the forms. Um, so it was actually a pretty deep organization, and each team has this. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned five bikes per, ride, per rider just now. Yeah. Do you typically switch during a ride, or do you pick the bike for the ride? I mean, not, not kind of crashes and stuff, but do you, do you switch bikes during a ride? Sure. Um, so typically, you'd have your home bike, like I mentioned earlier, um, and you'd have your race bike, and then you'd also have your spare bike. Um, so when you showed up at a race, there, your race bike, race bike would be there, your spare bike, and your time trial bike. Um, so I think that's four. And then you typically have like a, another backup. And what would happen is about halfway through the season, your, your race bike, it was like a rotation. Your race bike would become your home bike, and you'd turn your home bike back in. And then the, ba the, the bike kind of waiting in the wings, so to speak, would become your new race bike. So you'd, sp you'd use a race bike for about half the year, and then it would transfer over. Yeah? How often crash the captain and your experience with the crash event? How often people who are very, you know, like famous, like Lance or, you know, who, who are, you know, crash yeah. comparing to other people? Yeah, it's a, so I would typically kind of like sign up for one good crash a year. You know, that was just kind of the cost of doing business. And you're just hoping that however bad it was, you could recover as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I had my fair share. I, I, you know, broke my pelvis, my scapula, my collarbone, a couple fingers, uh, an arm. Um, you know, I probably smashed my head a handful of times and gone through a fair share of helmets. Um, and uh, that was just kind of, you know, part of the job, so to speak. Um, some riders were notorious for crashing all the time. You know, specifically um, in my team, I, I had a teammate, Tyler Hamilton, and for whatever reason, I swear Tyler would crash all the time. And when he crashed, he would really get hurt. Um, Julian Dean, you know, he's a sprinter, and sprinters tend to crash a lot. That's just kind of the nature of their business. They're kind of at a higher risk profile than, than other guys. And, you know, Lance, for the most part, only had a couple of crashes that I can actually remember. And, and that's actually significant because peop, most people don't realize how challenging it is to show up on race day healthy and um, prepared and have everything ready to be able to perform at your absolute peak. And um, the reason that that's significant is because there were a handful of times where I you know, was trying to, sh to prepare and show up for a race and whatever would happen, either illness or, or a crash would happen. Um, but there are just some riders that were better than others. Um, I also think that there are certain places in the bunch that are more dangerous than others, and that's also at specific times in the race. And it's, there's a real skill to knowing exactly where to be and when. Um, because also, remember, Racing is like economics. You, you, you have a finite amount of energy to expend, and you want to make sure that you expend it at exactly the right time. Um, so uh, it, you, you have to manage all of that um, with the hopes of getting to the finish line first. Yeah? What were some of the things that were hardest for you to learn? Some of the things that were hardest for me to learn. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges that I had, um, especially in my first couple of years of being in Europe, were how to adjust to just a completely different lifestyle, how to adjust to um, not being able to go to my home after the race, you know, whereas most of my peers and um, the people that I were competing against were at home, you know. At, at the end of the race, especially, you know, like for some of the Belgians and we're doing the Belgian classics, at the end of the race, they get in their car and drive home like it's like going to the office. And for me, I had to go to the airport and then I'd fly back to Spain, which is where my home base was. And, you know, it was kind of lonely at first. So I, I, that was my biggest challenge is how to overcome that. And, um, you know, I had this home life here in America that I also had to maintain at the same time. Um, and so that was a challenge. And I remember, I used to joke that um, the off season was about two months long, and I would have to fit an entire year of life into those two months. You know, do all my taxes and and kind of deal with all of my personal business and all of my friends and family, and make up for all the weddings and birthdays that I missed and stuff like that. So, you know, how to manage the, that sacrifice was a big challenge. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, yeah, two questions. So, yeah, I, I totally miss it. I mean, I, I miss the most um, my teammates. You know, it was like 
I went to war with these guys every day for a long time. Um, but we still keep in touch. And um, the, it's interesting, because when I, when I retired and came to work at Google, I didn't really ride my bike that much. And I realized um, the thing that I missed the most on a day-to-day -day basis was having that time every day to, to like think and process and, and um, for whatever reason, work out issues. And so now I try to ride more regularly because it's kind of like shower time, you know what I mean? It's like this interesting zone that you're in. Um, so yeah, those are the parts I miss the most. <laughs> That's right. So um, the question is, what is the bet for the ride in July? And, and uh, Lance is, is, um, is holding a Livestrong challenge um, for his foundation here in San Jose. And he, he and I, you know, he was kind of ribbing me that uh, Google wouldn't be able to raise the most money of all of the other corporations here that were going to set up corporate teams for the challenge. And so he and I kind of have this running bet. I'm like, no, 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 Google's going to raise the most money, yada, yada. And so the bet is basically um, th that either he has to go to, or either I have to go to Austin and do something, or he has to come here to Palo Alto and do something. And so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so, but you know, I really hope that you guys can help me uh, win the bet. So, um, if you go to Livestrong.com or .org, I can't remember which one it is. Um, you can read about the Livestrong Challenge. It's a great event. There's uh, 5K runs to 100-mile bike rides, um, and we can all all ride as Googlers and and uh, raise money for a great cause. So. Anyway, I'll end it with that. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I appreciate your time, and, and your questions were really interesting. And uh, remember to ride your bike to work tomorrow.